Hi guys, welcome back aboard good old Athena to what might be our last week here in Sherberg. We would like to start heading towards Ireland as soon as possible and that might possibly with a little bit of luck happen next week. But before the boat is ready to go, we've got a long list of DIY projects. My name is Mess, this is my wife Ava. I've spent the last five years on a somewhat extensive refit of our 1987 Warrior 38 named Athena. That was a DIY fun packed adventure complete with a very extensive osmosis treatment, building a new rudder using vacuum infusion, rebuilding the entire deck, gutting and subsequently rebuilding most of the interior, painting the top sides and a ton of other projects. The summer of 2021 we started cruising full time, now we're finally ready to begin our adventure. Here on our to-do list we've got a bunch of exciting stuff like for instance a new emergency bilge pump. We're going to be finishing a bunch of rigging up on deck, also replacing the main sheet. Ava's got a tiny little sewing project to do and then there are a bunch of smaller little jobs. I cheated a little bit yesterday and got started on some of the tasks off camera. For instance I spent about half a day installing strikers for our cabinet doors. A pretty boring yet time consuming job. The upside is that we now no longer need to tape the cabinet door shut while sailing. So we can go ahead and move this strikers task into the done column. Also yesterday I installed a ball valve on the plumbing to our washing machine. It is just a little bit of added insurance just to make sure we don't accidentally flood the washing machine machine with salt water while sailing. So we can also go ahead and close this washer plumbing task. The third and final task I took care of yesterday was to secure the engine room hatch. It was just a matter of moving the two barrel bolts a tiny bit, but that is also done. The first task I want to get started on today is to hook up our new emergency bilge pump. Right now if you peer into the abyss of our bilge you can see that there are two hoses going down there. There's one for a whale gulper IC electric bilge pump and then there is a 38 millimeter hose for a manual diaphragm pump out in the cockpit. One of those where you go waka 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 with a handle to empty out the bilge. Those waka 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 pumps are designed for emergency use but realistically no matter the circumference of your arm there's probably an upper limit to how long you can go waka waka waka. And that is why I want to install this Johnson heavy duty bilge pump. This is the 4000 gallons per hour version which I think equates to something like 250 liters a minute which of course sounds super impressive. But 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 of course that rating is without any kind of head meaning the pump doesn't have to lift the water. I would be hard pressed to see a realistic real world life example where that's going to be the case. And as soon as you add just one meter of head to this I think the rating drops to something like 2600 gallons per hour or 160 liters per minute. No matter the actual real world output of this guy it will still be nice to have a second electric bilge pump just as a backup even if we don't ever need it for emergency use. Fingers crossed. You have the option of running this pump with either a one and a half inch hose or a two inch hose. There is no way I could squeeze in a two inch hose. So yesterday with the help of my lovely wife Ava we ran the 38 millimeter hose from the bilge and up to the deck hole joint. So I'm all set to start installing the pump. But of course for this pump to come on automatically when the water starts rising we need some kind of floaty switchy thingy. We have one of those I think and I think it is in our aft cabin which yeah that is going to be a little bit of an adventure. Smokes, Batman, that off cabin is a mess. Alas, sweet, sweet taste of success. These Ultima switches are float switches without any moving parts, which well, that just seems like a great idea. Our high bilge water alarm, which is sitting right here, also came with one of those Ultima switches, and I could just wire the pump up to that. 
but I like the idea of having two separate sensors. In terms of Mr. Johnson here, a bare minimum of assembly is required. He comes with this flap here, which I am guessing is to keep water from flowing back into the bilge. So now I just need to attach this doohickey and he should be ready. Of course, that brings us dangerously close to the discussion of whether or not you should fit a check valve or non-return valve to your hose for the bilge pumps. But uh, yeah, I think that flappy thing is fine, but I'm certainly not gonna add anything else to the hose. The Ultima switch comes with this mysterious looking little doohickey here. He slides into the bottom of the switch and then the switch can be clicked into the little grady strainer bit on the pump. I'm going to place this whole assembly here above the normal water level in the bilge, which fluctuates up to a few centimeters or so. So if this ever sees water, well then the first bilge pump has either failed or it can't keep up with the water ingress. I made the electrical connections as per the instructions, heat shrinked the connections and covered everything up in a bit of conduit. And this is what it looks like now. A pretty neat little package. Now I found this stainless bracket here that I can use to secure the pump to the side of the bilge. Getting the pump installed, the hose connected and the wires run down there was a right pain in the behind. But cables are now running in behind here, behind the head and behind the shower into our technical compartment. In there, they are connected directly to the battery with a 25 amp fuse as per the instructions. The final step is gonna to be to remove those two drawers and put in the through hole in behind there. One big hole coming up. With Ava inside of the boat in charge of dust management, I drilled the hole from the outside. I then applied a little bit of Sigaflex to the through hole and et voila a finished bilge pump installation. Anybody familiar with boat work will not be surprised to learn that this was one day's worth of work. Jesus, I am ready for a break. Now, tomorrow morning, I think Ava's gonna take you guys for a little walk around Sherberg. We have been here in Sherberg. Still cannot pronounce it correctly, but we've been here for a little over a month. It's so crazy. It's gone by so fast and we've really been enjoying our time here. But before we leave, I would like to share a little more of Schaubog with you and take you on a walk up Roulet Mountain and we can get a really nice view of all of Schaubog. Fitting for this time of year, it has been really warm and sunny. But of course, today it's cold and windy, but the sun is coming out a little bit. Hopefully it stays out. It's only about a three kilometer walk from the marina up to the top of the mountain, but there is plenty to see on the way. Just outside the marina is the statue of Napoleon I. It was actually commissioned by the city in 1852 to honor Napoleon III because he had brought a railway system to Cherbourg. Napoleon I wanted to renew the wonders of Egypt and Cherbourg. That's why in the 1800s he built a dike here and he also built up the military base and that's what he's pointing to on the statue. He's surveying the land and contemplating where to put the dike and where to put the navy and that's essentially why Cherbourg is a huge port and what it is today. Just across from the statue this is the Holy Trinity Basilica with its very gothic facade. This is one of the oldest monuments here in Cherbourg. Churches date back from this plot of land all the way from year 435. In other words, she old. Beautiful, but old. Check out this old door. I want to know who is sneaking in and out of this baby. Here is a huge dry dock. I cannot find any information on it, but it looks old. That is where we are heading to the top of Roulet Mountain. The city of Cherbourg grew immensely between the First and Second World Wars. The sailing industry brought a lot of that, but immigration to the U.S. brought a ton of people through Cherbourg. Just in 1929 alone, 190,000 people passed through Cherbourg to get to the U.S. And for that time, that was a huge amount of people. Here is Napoleon III's infamous railroad don't know if it's running anymore. Those boxes are telling me otherwise. All right, getting closer, almost to the bottom of the mountain. At the bottom of Roulet Mountain is the public garden. It was built in 1887 for the people of Cherbourg to come and enjoy the wonders of nature. There's plants and trees from all over the world. There's a pond, there's a playground and a stage for concerts. It is really beautiful here. This is a cypress tree from Monterey, California. Ah, such a long way from home. 
Once through the park, we head out the back gate and start making our way up Roulet Mountain. The sun's out, there's a little bit of breeze. This actually turned out to be the perfect day to do this. All right, maybe it's getting too nice. I gotta start taking layers off. We made it all the way to the top. Let's check out the view. It's a little foggy, but there she is. Athena's whoop, right down there. Also at the top of the mountain is the Liberation Museum. It's laid out in a fort from the 17th century that was also occupied by the Germans during World War II. Cherbourg and Roulet Mountain were actually pretty vital during World War II. Cherbourg was occupied by Germans and on D-Day, soldiers were specifically sent to Utah Beach, just about 50 kilometers northeast of here, to come and take back Cherbourg which they did on June 25th, 1944. While Ava was gallivanting around Cherbourg, I got started on the first of the rigging tasks. That's this one, the rod kicker task. This task annoyingly involved replacing our brand new four sheave deck organizers with also brand new five sheave deck organizers to gain an extra sheave on the inboard side. To be able to reuse the old bolts, I needed to remove the old butyl tape. That is easily done with diesel or mineral spirits. The butyl instantly turns into a gooey mess. That is one of butyl's downsides. Definitely do not use butyl anywhere diesel might get in contact with it. After having secured the new deck organizers followed an endless amount of head scratching and contemplating to find the best suitable attachment point on the deck to avoid chafing any of the other lines. Then it was just a matter of expanding the hole in the fiberglass dodger to allow room for the extra line and then installing an extra clutch et voila. Now we should have a fully functional rod kicker. I am very excited to be able to close this rod kicker task because that means we are one step closer to being able to sail. There's more rigging stuff coming up tomorrow, but for now I want to get started on the nav station task. So we got one here that's called nav station hatch. One of the things I never got done back in Denmark was to make a hatch to fit in this hole here. So as a temporary fix, we've just been sailing around with this piece of plywood and that works perfectly fine. Except for when the boat heels over and that piece of plywood comes a flying. And also when that happens, the cushion comes a flying. So we actually have two tasks, one for making the hatch and one for securing the cushion. With the lip screwed and glued in place, that is it for the hatch task. Next up on our little to-do board here, let's take care of the nav station cushion task. That should be quick. To secure the Velcro, I use some of these stainless staples here. This is all stuff we've been sailing around with since we left Denmark, and a part of the explanation of why the aft cabin is such a giant mess. And another task bites the dust. Up until now, we've also been taping the charging station. So uh, let's correct that and get that secured. While I was securing the charging station, I also added this bit of trim to it so that any stuff we put up here is going to stay put when we're sailing. And I also added a couple of AC outlets to the forward edge of the charging station. So let's go ahead and close this task. Putting the trim on the charging island is actually a part of this task, which is called put up necessary trim. That's all the trim that's necessary to hold stuff in place so there's less stuff we have to stow away before we go sailing. A great example of that would be our little bread basket area up here. I made this piece of trim back in January at James workshop and if we just trim this a little bit we can mount that in here that'll keep the bread basket in place and whatever other stuff we want to store here. Quick little side note about the color of this wood. It might look very light right now in color but it is actually from the exact same piece of wood as the spice rack here. As you can see there is quite a lot of color difference. That is simply just because the spice rack has been exposed to UV rays here in the cabin, whereas this stuff has been sitting in the technical compartment, which is pitch black. So even though all of the trim might look very light in color right now, in a few months, it's gonna be a lot darker. Thank you. 
And that is all of the trim we have deemed necessary in place. We've got the holdy thingy up here. We've got the door thingy down here, the leg on the nav station, the trim here on the charging station. And we also have the trim here under the washing machine. Not all of this, especially not here under the washing machine, is strictly necessary for sailing. But it's nice to have it in place instead of having it taking up room in the aft cabin. That means we can go ahead and close the put up necessary trim task. Now we do have more trim we need to put up. We have a bunch of it in the forward cabin in fact. And we also have the covers over the knees over there. But all of that is going to require some of the headliner to come down which is a little bit of a pain in the behind. So I'm trying to group a bunch of stuff together that all requires removing the headliner before doing those. So yeah, for now we'll just stick to this trim. Now let's get Ava started on this task which is new nylon webbing for our in the cockpit that we used to clip into when we're sailing offshore and uh, I'll get started on these two rigging tasks. This is one of our old jack lines for the cockpit. It's definitely looking a little worse for wear although the stitching it doesn't look too bad. It looks like somebody hand stitched it and it held up pretty well but still we're gonna make some new ones just to be extra safe. These are our jack lines for up on deck. Luckily they happen to be too long and we were able to cut off just enough to make our new jack lines for the cockpit. While we're at it, to make sure everything is nice and safe, we are replacing the old hardware with this new shiny hardware. Although it was a small job, it was an important job, and now it's done and we can check it off the list. Jack lines are done. While Ava was taking care of the sewing, I managed to finish our preventer. I started this a few weeks back. There was just a little bit of tweaking needed. One more of these low friction eyes and now it's done. And I think it'll work really great. To rig the preventer, everything we need is right here on the line. That's these four low friction eyes and these Dyneema loops. So I think this is very convenient and I'm very excited to take it for a spin. Hopefully we'll have a bit of downwind sailing on the way to Ireland so you guys can see this in action. So we can go ahead and close the preventer task. Now, unfortunately, I didn't manage to finish the rigging for the pulled out head sail, so that will have to wait until the next video. There are a few tasks we're gonna let roll over until next week, but that's okay. In fact, it's actually kind of perfect because looking at the recent weather forecast, it looks like we're gonna be stuck here in Cherbourg for another four or five days. So we can take care of those and they go nicely along with these because as we tidy up in the aft cabin, we can also make a mattress and get that in there so we can sleep in the aft cabin while on passage and then to go along with hooking up the inReach and also tidying up some coax cable I want to finish installing our Iridium Go. So be sure to tune in next Sunday when we play around with our two satellite communication systems that's the Garmin 86i and the Iridium Go as well as hopefully get a mattress in the aft cabin although that is going to require a lot of tidying up. Ava's out shopping for groceries so I'm going to have to end this video the old-fashioned way meaning by myself. So I'll end this video by saying I hope to see all you guys back here aboard Athena next week for yet more DIY fun. As always, feel free to leave a comment down below and don't forget, if you've enjoyed this video, please remember to leave a like. See you!